You could have done what I'd done, but you ain't know what I'm on. In the track, tryna double it up. Now, after I did the video for um, why does Serbian Albanian um, people hated each other, there's a couple of people in the comment section that recommend this video. Here. It's Ottoman War, Skanderbeg, an Albanian rebellion documentary. Now, hopefully, this kind of give me a a little background story of like back in the days growing up and stuff like that a little bit of history you get me so you guys said this is a good video to watch so let's jump in and see what going on. i ain't gonna do no intro i ain't gonna do nothing this under that and the next this is almost 15 minutes long let's run it up okay now kings and generals Previously, we have covered a number of battles fought by the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans, yet events that happened in Albania were... So he made it a, a video of the Ottoman Wars separately, like the battles that they fight against different what, different countries or Albanian only. Or oh, this one is touching on Albania, but the rest was different countries. That As we decided to talk about them in a separate video. The leader of the resistance against the Ottoman expansion in this region was a legendary commander, George Castriotti Skanderbeg. His deeds would exalt him to the level of the likes of Stefan the Great, John Hunyadi and Stefan Lazarevich. George was born in 1405 to a formidable Albanian lord, John Castriotti. In 1415, he was sent as a hostage to the Ottoman court and started receiving military education at Enderun. Not much is known about this period in his life, but apparently he quickly moved through the ranks and the Sultan even granted him fiefs in Macedonia and Bulgaria. That is when he probably gained the nickname Skanderbeg, which can be translated as Lord Alexander from Turkish. So he John Castriotti rebelled. He was a leader of the Ottomans, but his his name is translated as a Turkish. I I ain't even gonna cap boys. I'm high. <laughs> John Castriotti rebelled against Ottoman rule twice between 1428 and 1436, and most of his lands were annexed. Yet his son did not join this cause and continued serving the Ottomans until 1443. Skanderbeg and his 300 men would desert the Ottomans either prior to or during the Battle of Nis, where Władysław III defeated the forces of the Sultan. Providing the governor of Kruja with a fake letter from Murad, Skanderbeg took over the city. On March 2nd, 1444, he managed to Skanderbeg is doing a mad thing. Unite the local Albanian and Serbian lords in the League of Leisure, thus forming a strong alliance against his former masters. Meanwhile, a power struggle between Murad II and Mehmed II Can forming just, a strong alliance against just said. On March 2nd, 1444, he managed to unite the local Albanian and Serbian lords in the League of Leisure. So he united Albania and Serbia together. Yeah. Thus forming a strong alliance against his former masters. To come together to fight Meanwhile, a power okay. struggle between Murad II so and... So this is like related to why Serbia and Albania is literally was... Why they aligned together back in the days up until now, yeah? So... It stems from this basically what you guys were trying to say. Mehmed II created a power vacuum in the Ottoman Empire. So he, he created this and alliance although Murad managed the to defeat the so Crusaders true. led by Vladislav and John Hunyadi at Varna in 1444, the situation in Albania remained precarious. In June of the same year, Murad sent one of his best commanders, Ali Pasha, along with 30,000 troops to crush the Albanian rebellion. Skanderbeg moved to a field called Torviol to block the Ottomans. The Albanians had a total of 15,000 men, 8,000 cavalry and 7,000 infantry facing the Ottoman army. So um, Serbia and Albania came together to face the Ottoman army, right? And that's all because of Skanderbeg, because he formed that alliance. You get it? So that's Skanderbeg had picked the battlefield beforehand and ensured his troops were paid and religious services were taken care of. Realizing his numerical disadvantage, he decided to use hit and run tactics and ambushes to make up for this. 
during the night of the 28th of June, his soldiers were resting, whereas Ottoman troops were celebrating, sure of a victory the next day. And that's because the Ottoman the battlefield troops was ideal. Is that because the Ottoman troops was way more numbered than actual Scandinavian army that he created? Bender with inferior numbers. It was only four kilometers wide, and a large army would have difficulty creating definitive battle formations. The next morning, June 29, 1444, Skanderbeg utilized an old but still relevant crescent formation, which he learned during his days as an Ottoman captain, with infantry on his flanks and footmen and archers in the center. He also hid at least 6,000 horsemen, divided into two groups, on the extreme left and right. Seeing that the Albanian... Well, it seems that Skanderbeg was a good leader, bro. Fuck, you know was not supported by cavalry, the Ottoman horsemen attacked Skanderbeg's center. And they come However, the Albanian footmen stood strong and managed to repulse the enemy cavalry. Skanderbeg knew that the Ottomans often used feigned retreats to dislodge their enemies, so he stopped his troops from chasing them. Seeing that, the whole Ottoman army attacked the Albanians and engaged along the whole line. As the valley was narrow, less than half of the Ottoman troops participated in the battle, the rest forming up into a second and third line. At Skanderbeg's signal, his hidden cavalry attacked from the right. Oh, However, plan, Ali Pasha bro. managed to turn part of his third line to nullify this threat. Skanderbeg yeah, then ordered his hidden force on the left to charge into the rear of the forces engaged with the Albanian right. This attack crushed the third line of the Ottomans and freed up all of the Albanian cavalry, which turned and charged no, the rest of the Ottomans from the rear. Hey, the Ottomans smart, were now surrounded, it? and according to various sources, lost anywhere from 10 to 20,000 in this massacre, while Skanderbeg's casualties were below 5,000. The defeat at Torvio was a massive blow to the Ottomans. Yet they were not going to leave the rebellious region in peace. So let me ask a question: If he didn't, if he didn't form the alliance with Serbia and Albania, do you think that he would have won that battle right there? If he didn't form the alliance without the help of both countries, so basically both countries was helping each other just because they're fighting against the Ottomans. I wonder if, but how did they turn towards themselves though? Because they are alliance; they have similar goals, you know. So I hope he speaks about how they start rebelling against each other. Following the victory, Skanderbeg retreated to the city of Kruja. The Ottomans were still focused on Hungary and John Hunyadi, so the three armies sent to Albania between 1445 and 1448 were relatively small. Skanderbeg defeated them using hit-and-run tactics. In the spring of 1448, Sultan Murad moved against Skanderbeg himself with an army of at least 50,000. Although the Albanians employed scorched earth tactics and continually attacked the Ottomans, Murad managed to besiege the important fortress of Svetigrad in May. Skanderbeg attacked the Ottoman camp but wasn't able to do much against the overwhelming Ottoman numbers. In July, Svetigrad's garrison... You know, it is bad days. It was only like... It was, when they're talking about war, yeah, it was only sticks and stones and like... You're actually fighting with your hand. You're fighting to defend your country, innit? But if you watch... If you guys watch like Game of Thrones and um, seasons like that, you kind of get a better understanding why people used to fight and there was so much debt back in those times because people were literally fighting for their country and their, their, their freedom and their rights. Similar like how people are doing that today but just in a different way but back then obviously they wasn't so advanced to you get me but it's the same thing that happened back then it still goes down generation to generation no matter what it might seem like it's literally the same thing. Fortunately for Skanderbeg, Hunyadi crossed into Ottoman territory and that forced Murad to move against him. Hungarian and Ottoman forces would engage in October at the Second Battle of Kosovo. Some sources claim that Skanderbeg attempted to help Hunyadi, but wasn't allowed to pass through the territory held by the Serbian prince, Juraj Brankovic. Regardless, the Ottomans won and were able to turn their attention to the Albanians yet again. 
In 1449, their forces took over the fortress of Berat. Well look, Christmas has come early, here's why. I have decided for the first time ever to bundle to... A year later, Murad arrived in Albania and besieged Kruja. Skanderbeg had opted to take the bulk of his forces outside the walls of the city and appointed Rana Conti as the commander of the garrison. So let me ask you a question as well. Do you guys class Skanderbeg as like a hero to your, your country and your background and history? Do you class him as a hero or he was just a, like he was just a rebel, innit? Do you guys class him as a hero if your country or does people look at him, look, look to him as a rebel? He was a rebel back in the day. So he's actually a hero that someone can say up to this day that they're proud of and like he's well respected nowadays. Do you guys say that? And was to attack the massive Ottoman army, numbering up to 100,000 from outside the walls. He employed this tactic. Whenever the Ottomans would get close to breaking in, he would divert their attention by attacking their rear. For nearly five months, from May to November, the Ottomans tried to break through the fortifications, even using cannons, but eventually this failed. Trying to bribe the commandant did not work. Realizing numbers would not bring victory and that winter was arriving, Murad decided to lift the siege and return to Iderna, where he would die and the throne would pass on to Mehmed II. Constantinople was the priority for Mehmed, so he sent other commanders to attack Skanderbeg in his stead, but they were defeated in 1452 at Modric and Mechad. It was obvious that the Albanian problem was not going away easily. In the meantime, Skanderbeg recognized the suzerainty of the King of Naples and Aragon Alfonso, thus gaining more funds and men. In 1455, Skanderbeg attempted to take Berat from the Ottomans and besieged the city. Believing that the small Ottoman garrison would be defeated soon, Skanderbeg decided to leave his forces under the command of his subordinates. This was a mistake. For one, Skanderbeg's commanders did not have his experience fighting in the Ottoman army. Also, a 20,000-strong Ottoman reinforcement army arrived under the command of Evrenos Issa Bey. Even though Skanderbeg rushed back to the city and repulsed Evrenos' troops, his army neither had the capacity nor the morale to continue the siege and had to retreat. Although not a decisive victory, the Ottomans saw the win at Berat as a sign that the war could be turned in their favour. After the death of Hunyadi in 1456, the Ottomans gained a respite on the Hungarian front. It became clear that the showdown between the Ottomans and Skanderbeg was fast approaching. The Ottomans mustered around 65,000 troops under Evranos to crush the League of Leisure once What do you think about that? 65,000 people marching on a field to go and fight? That's a lot of people, you know. And then when you come back, you're going to say at least 20,000, 30, 50, depends on what, died. That's just... That's mad. People who used to just born back in them days to just grow up. You don't even go to school, bro. As soon as you reach a certain age, you pick up a sword and you start fighting. It's mad. As for the Albanian side, Skanderbeg had to deal with a perpetual problem that always bothered him. Now he's protecting Relatives Albania, and allies though. turning against him. Oh, rah. It should be noted that the Ottomans, Venetians, rival Albanian nobles, and even the royalty of Aragon tried to manipulate Skanderbeg. Him, Nevertheless, Albania. the prudent Albanian ruler managed to form a 10,000 strong army and prepared for battle against Evrenos. After centuries of mobile warfare, the Ottomans needed formations. Archers in the rear, cavalry on the flanks and infantry providing the bulk at the center. So when Skanderbeg and his experienced men stormed the Ottoman camp near Albulena on September 2nd, 1457, there was nothing the Ottomans could do despite their numbers. More than 20,000 Ottoman troops were killed and their invasion failed. I told you like 20, Albulena became you you you're going with 65 and 20,000 die. That's mad. Just victory of the Albanian resistance against the Ottomans.
Between 1460 and 1462, Skanderbeg helped his suzerain Ferdinand of Naples. Bro, to me, so far, Skanderbeg looked like a hero to me. I don't know about you guys or what you guys are going to say, but to me, this video make him look like he's a, he's a legend. in Italy, both as a commander and a diplomat. A new Ottoman incursion forced him to return to the Balkans. They keep in on July of 1462, every time he, he defeated another army sent against him at still Mokra. Defeat them, bro. In August, Skanderbeg entered Macedonia and defeated three Ottoman armies in quick succession. This forced the Ottoman Sultan to sign a peace deal in 1463. He's, like, he's literally the protector. Yet, when later that year the Pope, Pius II, called for a crusade, Skanderbeg broke the peace, entered Ottoman territory in Macedonia, and pillaged it. However, Pius passed away before anyone else joined the crusade, so Skanderbeg was left to fight alone with minimal Venetian assistance. Mm. Still, in September, Skanderbeg and his 10,000 approached the Ottoman stronghold in the area, the city of Orid, which was defended by 15,000 under Sheremet Bey. Skanderbeg did not have enough troops to assault the fortifications, so he sent a small 500-strong detachment to lure the Ottomans out. This plan worked perfectly. The Ottoman forces rode right into the Albanian ambush and were slaughtered. More than 10,000 Ottomans were killed. So now the numbers Despite are even that, now. The remainder of the Ottoman army managed to escape and then defended Orid against Skanderbeg. Uh, he's actually a legend. Seeing that no Crusader support was arriving, Mehmet sent another army, commanded by Balaban, against Skanderbeg in 1465. But the Albanian leader was able to defeat his opponent yet again. Mehmet is coming. That was the last straw that forced Mehmet to muster an army that had between 50 and 100,000 troops and march against Skanderbeg in May of 40. Almost 100,000. Don't tell me that Skanderbeg is going to win. That's mad. 66. Skanderbeg had but less than 20,000 troops, and Albania, despite bro. his pleas, he received no assistance from Naples or Venice. No one. Is a system in this battle, is by Despite heavy Albanian resistance, Mehmed besieged Kruja. Still, the fortress held on under heavy Ottoman cannon fire, and Mehmed decided to retreat after pillaging the rest of the country and setting up an Ottoman administration in the eastern part. He also ordered the construction of many fortresses, thus limiting Skanderbeg's ability. Skanderbeg, basically, all you trying to say the Serbia, Serbians and the Albanians, they have heart. There's, they have heart because all, almost in numerous, almost in every single battle that they fought, they've been outnumbered. But they still came out on top. And he, this guy marched him with 100,000 and he still ran To continue forward. his resistance. Oh, Kruja was besieged again in 1467, but the results were similar. Crazy, man. In the beginning of 1468, Skanderbeg died of malaria. The oh, Venetians the took over the defense of Albania and continued gonna, resisting for a decade. Kruja would fall to Mehmed in 1478, which finally ended the three-decade-long Ottoman-Albanian War. Still, Skanderbeg left his mark on the history of the region and was declared the Champion of Christ, entering an elite company. It was the only thing that can take him down is sickness. Thank you for- No one took him down in battle. The only thing that took him down was just nature, bro. And that's just hot Skanderbeg. To me, Skanderbeg is a hero. And this video was only- It wasn't really touching on why they rebel against each other and they hate against each other. Um, Serbian Albania. It was only showing that back in the day, they used to alliance together because they, they wanted to fight. You get me? People that used to come and try to take their land. And Skanderbeg was- a, was an icon back in the days, someone that was very proud of his country or proud to be a part of that country to fight for them because remember that he, when he just started, when he was his brothers and stuff like that, you get me? You guys get it bro. Another episode in our series on the Ottoman Wars. New videos in this series are on their oh, way, the so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell icon. It's a nice we would piece like of to express you know? our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can. It's a nice piece of information, man. Well done for requesting that one right there. I really like this one. If you guys 
have any more videos like this to touch on history and stories like this just drop in the comment section below and i got you guys yeah now if you like these type of contents just slap up the like button subscribe to the channel for more content like this it's been your boy it's been your homie peace